As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm so glad you joined me for the program today. And I want to begin by saying thank you for turning on your television and allowing me to come into your home to teach you the Word of God. It's such a privilege, and it's an honor that you would make time for me, and I'm grateful to you. But today I'm believing you're going to get something brand new from the Bible, and we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 1, where we're considering the vision of Christ to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. And today we're going to really get into the vision. So I want you to reach for a piece of paper, something to write with, open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1, and join me as we dive into Revelation chapter 1. And today we're going to begin in verse 11. Now we've already covered verse 11, but very quickly I want to read it. And in verse 11 we find that Christ has appeared to John. In fact, let's go ahead and look at verse 10. In verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So John, as we've already seen, is in a cave on the Isle of Patmos. If you haven't seen the previous programs, please go to our archives on our website and watch them because these programs are filled with information, with history, theology about what happened in Revelation chapter 1, and I believe you will really get something out of it. But look again at verse 10. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me. The Greek word behind is very specific. It describes a physical location. John means literally back behind him. And you're going to see in a moment there was a physical element to this visitation. John physically turned around. He literally turned around physically to see this voice that was speaking to him. But it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. A trumpet in scripture was always used for a declaration or an announcement. So now we hear the voice of Jesus is like a giant declaration or his voice is booming like a trumpet. In fact, the Bible says a great voice, the word great, mega, the word voice, phone, it is a great booming voice. And listen to what the voice says in verse 11, saying, interesting, the word saying really is the word conversing. Jesus was saying these things over and over, trying to get John's attention, saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. We've already covered this, so we're going to move on. Then he says, what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. Then he lists the seven churches and the primary seven cities on a particular road in Asia. He says unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamum, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now very quickly, I want to cover again, verse 11, these seven cities which had the seven churches in the book of Revelation. First, it was the city of Ephesus, and the city of Ephesus, as we've already seen, was the gateway to all of Asia. Whatever succeeded in Ephesus, the door opened for it to go into all of Asia. The Holy Spirit very strategically sent Paul there first, because if the gospel would be received in Ephesus, if it would be established in Ephesus, it would open the door to the whole of Asia. Likewise, there are strategic places where God will send you. They may not seem so strategic to you at the first, but they're strategic. They're door openers. And that's what Ephesus was for the whole of Asia. But after Ephesus, then he says right to Smyrna. Smyrna was just about 35 miles from the city of Ephesus. And we've already seen Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus for many, many, many years, actually for decades. Right up the road in the city of Smyrna was another church which was pastored, it seems, the first pastor, a man named Stratius. And we know this because it's documented in a second century document that lists all the first pastors in the church of Smyrna. And Stratius was listed as the first pastor. We know that eventually Polycarp became the pastor, but the first pastor was Stratius, a man that was ordained by the apostle Paul. We even know who Stratius was. Early Christian writers tell us he was the natural brother of Timothy and was the elder brother of Timothy. Well, his name is not given in Scripture, 
that early Christian writers in the second century recorded his name and described his relationship to Timothy. I think this is such an interesting insight to ministry because Timothy, the younger brother, was pastoring the biggest church in the city of Ephesus. Just up the road was his natural elder brother who was pastoring a smaller suffering church in the city of Smyrna. What kind of competition existed between these brothers or what kind of a loving relationship? We don't know, but there were probably very many interesting things in their relationship as one had a larger church, one had a smaller church, but they were both in ministry. And because of them being related, there was a real connection between the church in Ephesus and the church in Smyrna. Then the Bible tells us to write a letter to Pergamum. Well, Pergamum was just up the road and Pergamum was the seat of the Roman proconsul who was the governor of the whole of Asia. This was a very important location, very important. What happened in Pergamum affected the whole of Asia. Persecution began in Pergamum, and the shadow of persecution from Pergamum fell upon the whole of Asia. Whatever happened in Pergamum eventually affected the whole region. So it was important that a church be there. We even know who was the pastor. It seems the first pastor was Antipas, whose name is listed in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. But after Antipas, we know from early Christian writings, there was a follow-up pastor whose name was Gaius. And probably Gaius was the pastor when John wrote the book of Revelation. Isn't it amazing what we know because of early Christian leaders who decided to write history. Thank God for people that write. Then just up the road from there, there was Thyatira. Thyatira naturally was a city that was constructed to protect Pergamum. Pergamum was a royal city. It was a treasure city. As I've told you, it's where the Roman proconsul lived. It's where the governor lived. It's where the king lived. So Thyatira was constructed to be a barricade against Eastern invaders who might try to attack Pergamum. But in Thyatira, there was a significant church. Then a little ways from there was the city of Sardis, where the legendary King Croesus lived, who was noted to be the wealthiest man in the world during his time. King Croesus ruled the Lydian kingdom from the capital city of Sardis. And in Sardis, there was a church. Then just up the road from Sardis, there was the city of Philadelphia on the eastern side of Asia. Interesting that Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, I've set before you an open door. That's very important because historically, it was the open door to the east. When you came to Philadelphia, it was the way to go east. And Jesus says, I've given to you an open door, which really meant they were an evangelistic church. They were a mission-minded church. And Jesus says, I've opened the door for you to go further into the east. Then you come to the city of Laodicea. And the city of Laodicea was a very wealthy city. I've been there many times. The ruins are just amazing. Very, very wealthy. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus even said to them, you're rich and increased with goods. Well, when you see the ruins in Laodicea, it's not hard to understand why Jesus said that. We know by the calculations we've done and by the calculations that have been done by archaeologists, it seems there were about 4,500 shops in the city of Laodicea. It was a wealthy, wealthy city. And in all seven of these cities, there were churches. And all seven of these churches were significant, very positive, very good, but all of them also had problems. And Jesus was very familiar with all of these churches. Now, stay with me because this is important to what you're going to see today in Revelation chapter 1. For example, to all seven of these churches, Jesus said, I know thy works. Jesus said that seven times. And all seven times, the word know is the word oida. The word oida is from a root, which means to see and to make a personal observation which means what Jesus knows about these churches is not what someone has told him in prayer. Jesus doesn't have personal, I'm sorry, secondhand information about these churches, but he has personal knowledge. He has been in these churches. We know that from Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, where the Bible says he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He had literally walked through the middle of these churches. And Oida, he says, I know. These are things I know about you, not because it was related to me in prayer, not because an angel told me. I know. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've made my own observation. This is what I know about you. And when he says, I know thy works, 
the word works, the Greek word erga, a better translation would be, I know everything about you. I know about all of your activities. There's nothing about you that I do not know. Jesus was very familiar with all seven of these churches from the largest to the smallest church. Sometimes we think the big churches get all the attention. But in this case, we find every church had attention. Jesus had walked through the midst of the biggest church, and Jesus had walked through the midst of the smallest church. And Jesus, to the church of Ephesus, which was the largest church, said, you've left your first love, and he commanded them to repent. Jesus said to the church of Smyrna, I know that you're suffering. He had no rebuke for them. He said to the church of Pergamum, you are in trouble because of doctrinal error that is working in your church, and he commanded them to repent. Jesus said to the church of Thyatira, you also have doctrinal problems. You're compromising with the world, and there's a woman in your church by the name of Jezebel that's seducing my servants, and I'm telling you to repent. Jesus said to the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, he said, you have a name that you're alive, but in fact, you're dead and you're dying right now. And he commanded them to repent and to strengthen what remained. Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, I know everything about you. I know about all the problems that you have and I've set before you a great open door. He said to the church of Laodicea, I know your works. Again, Oida, I've been there. I've seen it. I've made my own observation. The word works, the Greek word erga. I know about all of your activities. There's nothing about you that I do not know. And Jesus says, though you claim to be rich, the fact is you're spiritually blind and you're spiritually poor. And I'm standing on the outside of your church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The church of Laodicea was so worldly. It was so carnal that Christ was standing on the outside of the church asking to be readmitted. All seven of these churches were good, but all seven of them also had problems, maybe with the exception of Smyrna and Philadelphia. They had personal challenges, but they didn't have doctrinal challenges, not those two churches. Now, why did I go through all of this? Well, stay with me and you'll see why. So let's look at it again, verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. Then he mentions the seven cities that have the seven churches. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Then verse 12, and I turned to see the voice. This word turned, again, describes a literal physical move. This is a physical thing that John did, which tells us there was a physical dimension to this experience. Jesus is speaking behind him. We've already seen that in verse 10. And because the voice is coming from behind him, John physically turns around to see the voice that is speaking to him. Well, you can't see a voice. You hear a voice. Why would you turn to see a voice? Well, let me give you this illustration. If my mother were standing behind me and I heard her voice, I would know whose voice that was. And I would turn to see who was talking to me. I would know it was my mother's voice, but I would turn to see my mother. Her voice would attract me. I know my mother's voice. I would turn to see her because of her voice. When John heard this voice, he knew it was the voice of Jesus. He knew that. And when he heard this voice, he turned to see. He knew who he was going to see. But when he saw Jesus, he saw Jesus in a way that he had never seen Jesus before. It doesn't mean Jesus was different. Jesus is not different. Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But this aspect of Jesus had been veiled. It had been covered. And that's why we saw, especially in the first program, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the word revelation describes the removing of a veil or the removing of a curtain so you can see what is there. The veil in Revelation chapter 1 is removed so we can see the elements of Christ that no one had ever seen before. It had always been true, but no one had ever seen it until Revelation chapter 1. But look again at verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. The word spake, again, is the word converse. This voice was conversing with him, Christ trying to draw him into a conversation. And I want to tell you that Christ is always appealing to us, trying to pull us into a conversation. The Lord wants to talk with us. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden 
candlesticks. Who did he turn to see? He turned to see Christ. But when he turned, rather than first see Christ, what did he see? The first thing that he saw, the focus of his attention was not on Christ, but it was on the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks we know from Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 are the seven churches of Asia. And here they are symbolically portrayed as seven golden candlesticks. Now, this is why I'm reviewing. I want to make this point. This word candlestick is really the word luknas in Greek, which describes an oil burning lamp. There were no candles like we have candles today. They had oil burning lamps. And I want to show you again an authentic oil burning lamp from the first century. I have a whole collection of them. This one is round, has a figure on the top of someone offering a sacrifice to a God. Every oil burning lamp looked different. They have different decorations. They have different emblems. They're very intricate, different details. They have the same basic structure. They have the same basic style, but they're all a little different. They're handmade, and therefore it's impossible the two lamps be the same. But they have the same basic structure. Usually they're round or they're pear-shaped, and they hold oil. They have a handle so that the owner can direct it where it needs to go to give light and darkness. And there's a mouth, which is at the front of the lamp. And at the front of the lamp, the oil was poured into the lamp through the mouth. And a long wick was put into the lamp. And the wick would become saturated with oil. And then when set on fire, it would give light in darkness. And these oil burning lamps could burn for a long, long time. And as I told you, they're all different. This one looks like this. This one has the same structure, the same function, but you can see it's a little different. This one has Hebrew Jewish decorations. This particular one is before the first century. This is a Greek oil burning lamp. These are all genuine. These are real artifacts from the ancient world. So important, all these things. Symbolism is very important in Scripture. There are no two churches that are the same. We have the same function. We have the same purpose. We are containers of the Holy Spirit because we are the church. We are the house of God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we hold the oil of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord has the right to direct us just like an oil burning lamp in any direction that he wants to direct us. And no two lamps in the first century pointed in the same direction. They were all used to bring light to a different area of darkness. And likewise, every church has its own mission. It has its own call. Don't compare your church to other churches because God is probably directing your church a little differently. Every oil burning lamp had a mouth. Likewise, the gospel is to be preached. There is a mouth for the church. The church is to be saturated with the oil of the Holy Spirit and then set on fire. And when we're saturated with the Holy Spirit, then we become a light in darkness. Wow, there's so much to this. However, an oil burning lamp from the first century was made out of clay. It had defects. It was breakable and easily replaceable. But when you come to this verse, these oil burning lamps are not made out of clay. They're made out of gold. The word gold being the Greek word krusas, which was the most valuable commodity in the earth at that time. Nothing was more valuable or precious than gold. And now Jesus says, these churches to me, they're not clay. They're not defective. They are gold. Now, even today, people in the church see the defects in their church. They see what they don't like in their pastor. They see what they think their church should be better at. They may see things happening in their church that they think are carnal or impure, or the church could certainly be better. But hey, we've already seen what was going on in these seven churches. These seven churches had serious problems. Jesus rebuked five of them, told them to repent. But even with their defects, Jesus still said, they are gold to me. He paid for them. He redeemed them. He gave his blood for them. They were containers of the Holy Spirit. And even though from the human side they had defects, Jesus says it doesn't matter. They are the church. They are gold. If this is the opinion of Jesus about the church, then this also needs to be our opinion about the church. We need to value the church and realize the church is golden to Jesus Christ, and therefore it ought to be golden to us. But notice what else it says. 
In verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, now we see the word luknas again, in the midst of the oil burning lamps, again symbolizing the seven churches, one like unto the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. But notice this verse says Jesus was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The word midst, the Greek word mesas, which means to be right in the very gut or right in the very center of a thing. Jesus was not distant from the church. He was not shunning them because of their defects and their problems. Jesus was proud to be associated with them, even though they had internal problems. They were golden to him. He loved them. They were the containers of the Holy Spirit. They were the ones giving light in darkness. They were his people carrying out his mission in the earth. And Christ in this verse is seen in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And notice what he looks like standing in the midst of them. Oh, this is so powerful. One like unto the Son of Man, like unto is a Greek word which means he had the resemblance of the Son of Man, just the resemblance, but yet John is seeing him so differently. For example, in these verses, he sees him as the Son of Man, a resemblance of the Son of Man. In a certain way, he looked like Jesus that he had known in the flesh, but in another way, he looked a little different. He just had a semblance or a resemblance of the Son of Man. But so many other things were different. For example, he was clothed with a garment down to the foot. He had a girdle about a golden girdle about his breast, his chest. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like in defined brass, his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in all of its strength. So in one way, John says, it was the form of Jesus. I recognize the form. He had a semblance. He had a particular countenance as the Son of Man, and yet there were so many elements that were different that John had never been allowed to see before. But notice what John concretely says first. What he notices first and foremost above everything else. Now you would think maybe he would have talked first about his eyes as a flame of fire. Or maybe he would have said first, wow, a sword went out of his mouth. Or maybe he would have said first, oh, his feet shined like brass in a furnace. John could have noted any of these things first, but he didn't. What did John note first? The first thing John says he saw, and this is important for you to understand. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot. And this particular phrase describes a garment which goes all the way down to the foot, and the foot is uncovered. There's no shoes. He's standing barefoot. This is exactly the clothing of the high priest, which is described in Exodus chapter 28. Now, as we continue in this text in Revelation chapter 1, you're going to find that Jesus' feet are likened to brass. Brass represents judgment. And Jesus was definitely coming with judgment to the churches who would not repent. You're going to see this is very merciful, this is really wonderful. But before Jesus is seen as one coming in judgment, before he is seen as a judge, first he is seen as a priest. Jesus is standing in the middle of the church. He is dressed like a high priest because he is a high priest. The book of Hebrews tells us he ever lives to make intercession for us. And standing in the midst of the church, seeing their problems, seeing their challenges, and yet knowing that they're golden, not shunning them, not standing away from them, but right in the midst of them, Christ stands as a great high priest where he is praying for these churches. He's praying for them to hear his voice. He's praying for them to repent. He's praying for them to make it. He's praying for them and urges every one of them to be overcomers. That's what he's praying for them as their great high priest standing in the midst of them. And then after that, John then begins to describe everything else that he saw about Christ in this glorious visitation. And we're out of time. Wow, I've enjoyed today so much, and I can hardly wait for the next program where we're going to continue right here, and we're going to finish this program, this series, in the next program. But thank you for joining me again today, and if you have a prayer need, please let us know how to pray for you. Use the information that's on the screen to contact us, and as soon as my team hears from you, I assure you 
we will quickly go to prayer on your behalf. We really mean that. But I want to remind you of Ecclesiastes 8, 4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. In John's vision of the exalted Christ, Rick shares the riveting account of the exalted Christ appearing in a vision to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos to deliver his ageless messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Walk through several verses of the first chapter of Revelation as well as pages of church history as we explore many untold details of the last living original apostle, the Apostle John. This captivating five-part series includes John's exile on the Isle of Patmos, how John identified himself to believers as their companion in suffering, how supernatural occurrences take place, Christ's eternal positioning, and why he likens the church to candlesticks. What the exalted Christ revealed to the Apostle John about the condition of the seven churches a message that applies to the church today. This eye-opening series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. We're also offering Rick's book, A Light in Darkness. Discover the world of the first century church in this richly detailed historical narrative enhanced by classic artwork and beautiful photographs shot on location at archaeological sites. Survey the culture, people, and practices surrounding early believers in the cities of Ephesus and Smyrna. This book will make the lands and the message of the Bible come alive to you as never before. This beautifully bound, 800-page, full-color biblical resource can be yours for $80. Don't miss these special offers, this series, John's Vision of the Exalted Christ, and the book, A Light in Darkness. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.